And then remember the G key, right? That will give you a way to change your gradient origin. And that can be done very simply just by typically clicking right over here and just moving that guy around with the mouse. Now, the next thing I want to talk about real quickly before we get to this idea of creating uh, custom controls on the fly is Blend also has an editor, which I briefly showed you when I was changing around the skew of my stack panel, um, which allows you to work, to work with transformations. So you can actually do this in two different ways. There's actually a transform editor in your properties window, but pretty much all these things can be done directly on the designer surface. So let me go ahead and flip back yet again. So why don't we pick on this guy for a while. So I'm going to go ahead and play around here with my square. Right? Let's make him a slightly different size. And I think we're done with this guy. So let's we'll go back to the square. Alright, so if you want to, you can actually come over here to your transform editor. And all the core transforms are listed here. Translate, rotate, scale, skew, right? So if you wanted to get really, really precise, you could come in to maybe rotate. And I could just start to play around with some angles here. I can also just kind of uh, come and move the slider around. You can see in my designer, it's kind of flipping this guy back and forth. As I'm doing this, Blend is just maintaining a transform group. One thing which is a little weird is Blend gets a bit aggressive when it tries to define your transform. So as soon as you're over there in that editor, even if all you're doing is tinkering with the skew, it's also going to be throwing in some, uh, well, I guess I was doing the rotate, wasn't I? Even if all you're doing is playing around with the rotate, it's going to also throw in other transform objects for you, even if they're not used. You know, you got bigger fish to fry in your life than a couple of basic objects, you know, but I suppose if you really wanted to be prim and proper, you could delete those out if you don't want them there, but it's probably not going to have any, any real bearing on what you're doing. So if you don't want to come over here, remember that the editor itself can be used for almost all these operations. So if you wanted to just rotate the rectangle here, notice when I go to a corner, my mouse changes. That's how I'm doing my rotate. If you wanted to slant it, you know, skew it, come to a side. And you just got to put your mouse cursor right next to the grab area. See how it changed? Now I can kind of skew it out in different ways. Right? And I can also come over here and kind of play around with like points of origin. Right? There's my scaling. So Pick your poison. Either way you go, what you're ultimately doing is you're configuring a transform groove on the selected item. And then one other thing I want to point out um, before we get to some other topics. Blend has these two different selection um, pointers. And I know for me, it was really confusing. I, for the life of me, could not figure out what in the heck a direct select versus a select really, really meant. I mean, I'm going to select it, right? So what's the difference? Well, I've already shown you one example when we were talking about complex content. Remember that we, uh, we zoomed in on that button really, really deep, and I did a direct select so I could get into that button and get to the content area. Well, from a real general purpose, okay, if you are doing a select, just a basic old select with this guy right here, that allows you to just click on the designer and, pardon the redundancy, but just select the thing itself with all of its little sub pieces, right? So if I had a button that had a nested stack panel and I do a select, I'm really just selecting the button. If I do a direct select, using this guy down here, well now I could drill into the things in the button. This is also really helpful when you're working with geometries. So check this out. Let's go ahead and blow him away. Imagine that we are working with the uh, pencil and I've made some kind of a path, right? So see how I just grabbed my last brush by the way? I warned you guys about that. 
So if I don't like that, I could just hit no brush, but that's fine. We'll, we'll leave them as an orange thing. So right now, again, if I were to do a basic selection, that just kind of allows me to reposition this thing in the canvas. Okay? And that's going to be helpful when you want to do things like scale it or rotate it. But what if I needed to come and fine tune how this path actually looks, right? Maybe I want this part of my shape to kind of dip in this way. Well, that would be a job for a direct select. You see how I just activated the sub parts of the path, right? So now I can start to kind of play around with how this guy is going to look. So I'm actually operating on the interior of the shape, right? Not the shape itself. So now if I actually want to grab him to relocate it in the window, I got to come back to just a basic select. So because you're going to probably be toggling between these all day long, there's a couple of handy keyboard shortcuts, A and V. And remember now, we're not doing control anything. You just click the letter A, click the letter V. Now, I think this one's kind of unfortunate because I keep thinking about copy and pasting, but you know, what do I know? <laughs> Okay, so the last part here before we get to making custom controls is about working with uh, resources. WPF and Silverlight both support this idea of object resources. Really, really common. Essentially what an object resource is, is a way for you to define a blob of markup, give it a name, and refer to it all over the place. And when you want to use that object resource and you want to refer to it in other areas, we use markup extensions. Uh, typically, static resource will get you there, but you could also use dynamic resource if you want to. So let's take a peek at how we can do that inside of a blend project.